Hello everyone, Dark of All Trades here. Now for today, I want to talk about rationality. I want to talk about what makes sense. My whole channel is based on using reasoning and logic to explain issues and why we should or should not, or at least why I do or do not, accept these arguments or positions. Not everyone is going to be convinced, and I often disagree with even other atheists on certain topics. I'm probably more educated than many on these topics, but that is why I want to get my thoughts out there. Of course, I can make mistakes, and I am always willing to learn. My comment extension is rife with information for me to soak in and evaluate. Speaking of soaking in, today's video comes from a channel called Dennis Pollock, who seems to run Spirit of Grace Ministries. I don't know anything about this guy, and that is how I like to go into these. I want to address the arguments as he's bringing them up directly. Speaking of, today's video is titled Why Atheism is So Irrational! This leads me to believe he's going to talk about logic and rationality. Is he going to get basic ideas wrong? Well, the track record shows that that is possible, but not necessarily sure. Maybe Dennis here has some sort of logic background. I haven't checked, but I'm sure it will show through his content. So let's see what Dennis has to say. Logic can be a useful tool, but our logic is never perfect. As we read the Gospels of Jesus Christ, we can find all sorts of faulty reasoning and inadequate logic used. You know, I've been saying that for years. Finally, a religious person recognizes that there is so much wrong with the logic in the Bible. I know it's really easy to sit here and pick apart specific examples of faulty reasoning and inadequate logic use in the Bible. Fun, too. So let's look at some. The Gospels often portray Mr. Jesus performing miracles but these accounts primarily appeal to those who have already believed in his divinity. For example, in John 20, 29, Mr. Jesus says to Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This encourages belief without evidence, fostering confirmation bias among believers. The Gospels contain passages that support certain moral or theological viewpoints, but they ignore or downplay others that may contradict those viewpoints. For instance, when Mr. Jesus preaches love and forgiveness, he also endorses violence in some passages, such as Luke 19.27, where he says, But those enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. This selective reading serves to support predetermined beliefs rather than engaging in comprehensive analysis. In Matthew 12.30, Mr. Jesus states, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. This presents a false dichotomy, suggesting that there are only two options, being with Mr. Jesus or against him, without considering other possibilities or perspectives. Now, this is one I get questions on sometimes, so I would like to expound on this just a little bit. Why is this a false dichotomy? Alternatives would demonstrate that the dichotomy presented in Matthew 12.30 oversimplifies the complexities of belief and non-belief, suggesting that there are more nuanced perspectives beyond simply being for or against Mr. Jesus. So what are some alternatives? One could choose to remain neutral or indifferent to Mr. Jesus and his teachings, neither actively supporting nor opposing him. Individuals may adhere to different religious or philosophical beliefs that neither align nor oppose Mr. Jesus' teachings. Rather than outright acceptance or rejections, some may choose to critically examine Mr. Jesus' teachings and make decisions based on evidence, reasoning, and personal reflection. One's upbringing, cultural background, or societal norms could influence their stance towards Mr. Jesus without necessarily aligning with or opposing him consciously. Instead of immediately taking a stance, individuals might adopt an open-minded approach to exploring Mr. Jesus' teachings, considering them alongside other sources of wisdom and knowledge. Now, I could go on and on about example after example of things in just the Gospels, let alone the Bible of all the bad logic, but let's just get back to the video by those who are determined to prove Jesus was a fraud. I knew something like this was going to happen. Let me show you that he actually put a pause here, and it wasn't just me being silly. All sorts of faulty reasoning and inadequate logic used by those who are determined to prove Jesus was a fraud. See? Do you think that was intentional? Though I suspect that he's just going to try to justify this with a lot of cherry-picking I just talked about. So much so that I potentially see a Texas sharpshooter fallacy incoming. Brace yourselves. Let's consider a few of their arguments. In the sixth chapter of John, Jesus declares that he is the bread of life who has come down from heaven to give life to the world. This is an excellent example of an assertion, a claim that Mr. Jesus would need to back up. Does he give supporting evidence following this verse? No. In fact, 
The story continues to say that many of his disciples didn't accept his blatant assertions and deserted him. His words didn't even convince many of the people that followed him. Those people were using logic and not accepting something just because a rabbi told them something. I wonder if the fact that someone just makes a claim is sufficient enough for this dentist guy to believe that claim. I would guess not, but he expects people to accept what this very random rabbi said 2,000 years ago? Now that's just too much for his critics who protest, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I've come down from heaven? Some of these folks had watched Jesus grow up, and now he was telling them he had come down from heaven? Ridiculous. See, he is aware that these people had good reason to not accept these outlandish claims. Let's put this into a more personal context. Let's presume that you believe in some kind of theistic God. You have met your neighbors over 25 years ago, and they had a young child when you met. Over the course of these next two and a half decades, you notice this child grow up, go to school, play in the yard, interact with other neighborhood children, eventually graduate high school, get a job, get a car, move out of their parents' house, all of the generally normal things that a person does as they grow up. Then, at 30 years old, he tells you he is literally the child of God. Then how would you react? Would you simply accept what he says, even if he has a prepared speech about it? All right, I am the Messiah! He is, he is the Messiah! I would guess not. Even if they could do some fancy magic tricks that you couldn't figure out, would that change your opinion? Or would you think that maybe they just have some sort of complex? A complex complex. One where they think they're God. What is that called again? A lunatic God complex! Oh yeah, God complex. Any rational human would not accept this person was the child of any god. So like I said before, it sounds like the people in the story were using logic by not just accepting what this person was saying because they had this evidence from years of experience watching this Mr. Jesus being a relatively normal person for that time. I can talk about the so-called miracles later if it comes up. But there was a huge factor in this equation of which they were totally ignorant, and that is called the Incarnation which is the centerpiece of Christian theology. Here is another claim. Christian theology makes the claim that their God became a man. This is a reasonable thing for anyone to not be aware of at the time. Why? Let me break it down into a few factors. The doctrine of the Incarnation was not universally understood or accepted during this time. While it became a central tenet of Christian theology in later centuries, its full implications were likely not comprehended by many of Mr. Jesus' contemporaries, including his disciples and followers. Expecting them to grasp and accept such a complex theological concept without adequate explanation or evidence is unreasonable given the historical context. Why should we assume that individuals at the time should have readily accepted the doctrine of the Incarnation? What evidence or logical reasoning would have been available to them to support such a belief? As I just mentioned, there is a stark lack of historical documentation or contemporary understanding of the doctrine among Mr. Jesus' audience, so it would have been unreasonable to expect their immediate acceptance. I suggest that doubt or skepticism among the audience would have been the rational response to teachings that challenge conventional beliefs or lack clear evidence. Dennis needs a more empathetic consideration to the perspectives and limitations of individuals living in a different cultural or historical context, rather than imposing modern theological expectations upon them. I acknowledge that critical examination of religious claims and teachings is a valuable aspect of intellectual inquiry, both in ancient times and today. Doubt and skepticism are healthy responses to unfamiliar or extraordinary claims, which prompt people to seek a deeper understanding and evidence before accepting them as true. Even if Christianity were 100% true and everything in the Bible was accurate, we are talking about the logic and reasoning of people at that time. As shown in my analogy before, it would be unreasonable for people to just accept that this rabbi was some divine being, even if it was true. This is something that can be difficult for people to wrap their heads around. Simply because we now know something is true, doesn't mean it was always logical to accept that thing as true. The Incarnation declares that unlike ordinary humanity, Jesus existed long before his birth. Indeed, there never was a time when he did not exist. God became a man and entered his creation. The Jews who ridiculed and scorned the idea of Jesus coming down from heaven to give life to the world knew nothing of this, of course, and it is impossible to come to right conclusions when all the facts, especially the most important ones, are unknown. He keeps seeming to get the point every time, but somehow comes to an opposite conclusion. 
These people made logical and rational decisions and didn't believe someone who made outlandish claims. Humans don't wait until we have all the facts to come to conclusions. Though here is where I need to take exception to his point. He specifically said, It is impossible to come to right conclusions when all of the facts, especially the most important ones, are unknown. This is definitely not true, as presented in his own theology. Let me go back to granting that everything in the Bible is true, that God exists, etc. In that same story in John 6, 68-69, nice, the twelve disciples responded that they have come to the opposite conclusions and accepted Mr. Jesus' words and believe he is the Holy One of God. So if the twelve disciples had the same information that the ones that turned away had, but came to the opposite conclusion, and by granting everything, including the right conclusion, then it is possible to come to right conclusions when all the facts are unknown. While it's true that having all the facts, especially the most important ones, is ideal for reaching accurate conclusions, it is also important to recognize the role of instinctual reactions rooted in our evolutionary history. Consider a scenario on the savannah of Africa. When we hear rustling in the nearby bushes, jumping back is an innate response. While it may seem unnecessary if the rustling turns out to be just the wind or something harmless, the potential risk of ignoring it is far greater. If, however, that rustling is indeed a lion ready to pounce and eat you, then that quick reaction of jumping back could save your life. The point is, in either case, waiting to ascertain whether it's a line or something harmless before reacting could be fatal. Therefore, our predisposition to react swiftly to potential threats, even in the absence of complete information, is an evolutionary adaptation honed over millennia to increase our chances of survival. In situations where immediate action is necessary, such as facing potential danger, waiting for all the facts to be known may not be feasible or conducive to survival. Another time, Jesus told his audience, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. No, this isn't another time. This is from the same story. This passage is from John 6.53. It is another claim that is not backed up. But let's see where he's going with this. If Jesus, being the bread from heaven, gave them problems, this was worse still. They asked, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Many who had been following him returned to their homes and refused to follow him any longer. This is the ending of the story where the many disciples left and the twelve stayed I just talked about. Here is how close this example is to the last one he gave. Does Dennis really think this one story is actually multiple ones? Anybody saying such crazy things surely could not be the Messiah. But Jesus was not talking about literally eating his flesh. However, he made no attempt to straighten out his critics. We learn something about the nature of God in this incident. He makes people say weird things? He thinks metaphorical language is a good idea? He is okay with people not knowing what he means and fighting about it for literally thousands of years and killing each other over these differences? Because that is what happened. The sheer lack of clarity has been devastating for humanity. This is a major reason why I think that if God does exist, even excluding all the overtly heinous things that he has said and done, he is a moral monster. God does not feel obligated to make everything plain to us. So God is the author of confusion? Doesn't that contradict something in the Bible? If he doesn't feel obligated to make sure his message is understood in the way that he intended it to, then God is a pretty terrible communicator. This is Communication 101. This is why speaking in riddles is not how people communicate important ideas. We want to ensure we are understood. The Bible tells us we walk by faith, not by sight. And faith is a bad thing. Is that how people get around any new place? Or when we are in a new city, do we look for street signs and landmarks so we don't get lost? When we try a new hobby, do we go by faith? Or do we listen to people who have done it before and get information? If you want to try skydiving for the first time, but don't know anything about the process, do you do that by faith? Or do you listen to people who have skydove? Skydived. What's the term? Well, I just looked it up, and apparently either is fine. Fun fact of the day. The point is that we don't do things by faith. When it comes to making big decisions, we usually want a boatload of evidence, right? Take flying a plane, for example. Can you imagine just grabbing a manual or a stack of manuals as thick as a Bible with no pictures and deciding to fly? No way. We would want clear instructions, diagrams, and probably some serious training before we even think about taking off. So why would we approach something as massive as potential eternal life with anything less than that level of scrutiny? It's like saying, hey, keep your fancy training. I'll just go with what this book says. No questions asked. But come on, shouldn't we treat our spiritual journey with the same level of care and curiosity? 
That means looking into details, questioning, and seeking out multiple perspectives, just like we would with any other big decision. We've got this thing called critical thinking for a reason, right? When Dennis criticizes others' logic and reasoning, yet turns around and says, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight, it's almost like saying, don't bother with evidence or critical thinking, just have blind faith. But isn't that the very opposite of what he's advocating for? If we're going to question and challenge others' reasoning, shouldn't we encourage a more thoughtful and evidence-based approach? For those of us who value critical thinking, faith is just not going to cut it. And this implies there will be times when we simply don't get it. We don't get what God is doing in our lives. We don't understand what the Bible means in certain places. We don't get why our loved one had to die young, while ungodly people sometimes live to a ripe old age. We just don't get it. And whose fault is that? But that aside, what exactly is the point of this? If any of you are not an atheist, can you see what this looks like from the perspective of an atheist? We don't understand X, Y, Z, therefore we should just assume that there is some motivation behind it. There doesn't need to be an intelligence behind the rationale for terrible things, but Christians like Dennis say there is. I would guess it's because they need a justification because they're uncomfortable with not knowing something. Of course, this becomes a god of the gaps because we learn why things happen, and nothing we have found the actual answer for has ever been because God. Well, welcome to the club. Here's a little secret for you. You're not supposed to always get it. God reserves the right to try your faith by not running to you and giving you a detailed explanation every time some part of your life does not go according to plan, and you start whining. I actually was going to put this up for the last part, but I think it fits better here. There are times where it's okay to lament things going wrong in your life, and people always seem to use that term whining like it's a bad thing. There are times where whining is an okay thing to do. Expressing frustration, disappointment, or discontent in a healthy manner can be a natural and valid part of processing emotions and experiences. Whining occasionally can serve as a release valve for pent-up emotions and stress, allowing you to acknowledge and address your feelings. Of course, being mindful of frequency and context is important, as well as making sure to balance it with constructive coping strategies. This term so often seems to mean what people do when they talk about an issue I don't think is a problem or one that should be talked about. But I don't want to spend too much time on this. This is simply a gripe I have with people who try to use manipulative language to diminish the problems that people experience. As some were leaving in frustration over Jesus' words, Jesus turned to his twelve apostles and he asked them, Do you also want to go away? Peter, as was often the case, spoke for the group. He did not understand Jesus' teaching any more than those who were leaving. But he knew one thing. He had tasted the goodness and beauty and grace of Jesus, and he was not about to walk away. He answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I promise I did not watch the video before responding. This is the exact example I used to show his other point about coming to true conclusions without all the facts was wrong, even in his own story. What is it called when you refute your own story, but you think you're supporting it? I seem to remember another YouTuber called Rationality Rules said something about it. Is it Trojan Horsing? I can't remember. Let me know in the comments if you find info on this. I'd love to recheck it out. And so it must be with every one of us when we face that dark hour where nothing makes sense and Satan whispers his evil lies into our ears attempting to persuade us to forsake the Lord. In the seventh chapter of John, some felt they had a sure argument against Jesus being the Messiah. They protested, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Sticking with John, I see. There are other books in the Bible, you know. It was well known that Jesus grew up in Nazareth, a sleepy little village in the Galilee region. But every knowledgeable Jew knew Micah's prophecy, which announced that Bethlehem would be the city from which the ruler in Israel would come forth. Surely this was unmistakable evidence that Jesus could not possibly be the Messiah. This is a problem in the Bible that gets a fair amount of attention, but I'll talk about it briefly. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Mr. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This is based on the prophecy from Micah 5.2, which was restated in Matthew 2.6. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. 
Matthew's account describes how Mary and Joseph, who lived in Nazareth, traveled to Bethlehem for the census, and Jesus was born there in fulfillment of prophecy. On the other hand, the Gospel of Luke suggests that Jesus was born in Bethlehem but raised in Nazareth. Luke's narrative does not mention a census requiring Joseph and Mary to travel to Bethlehem. Instead, it describes Mary and Joseph as residents of Nazareth who traveled to Bethlehem because of the census, and Jesus was born there during their stay. Another difference between the two accounts is the genealogy of Mr. Jesus presented in each gospel. Matthew traces Mr. Jesus' lineage through Joseph's ancestry, highlighting the connection to King David. Meanwhile, Luke provides a genealogy of Mr. Jesus that goes through Mary's lineage, tracing it back to Adam. Additionally, each gospel writer emphasizes different theological themes and aspects of the birth narrative. Matthew often highlights the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, while Luke focuses more on themes of salvation for all people, as well as the humble circumstances of Mr. Jesus' birth and the inclusion of marginalized groups such as shepherds. So while both Matthew and Luke agree that Mr. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they differ in the specific details surrounding his birth, including the reasons for Joseph and Mary's presence in Bethlehem and the theological themes emphasized in each gospel. This discrepancy has led to scholarly debate and various attempts to reconcile the two accounts. Some scholars propose harmonizations or explanations that attempt to reconcile the differences between Matthew and Luke, while others suggest that the differences reflect theological emphasis or literary conventions rather than historical accuracy. These critics were both right and wrong. It is true Jesus grew up in Nazareth, but what they did not know was that Jesus had been born in Bethlehem. They were missing one important bit of information which totally undermined their entire argument. You see, for logic to be completely reliable, you must, one, know all the facts, two, have perfect understanding and the ability to apply all the facts, and three, be completely unbiased. I have a problem with this for a number of reasons. While having comprehensive knowledge of relevant facts, a thorough understanding of the subject matter, and the ability to apply those facts without bias can certainly enhance the reliability of logical reasoning, it's important to note that achieving complete reliability is an ideal rather than a practical reality, at least in many cases. Let me explain why. It's often impractical, if not impossible, to know all the facts relevant to a given situation. The world is complex and constantly evolving, with new information emerging over time. While striving to gather as much relevant information as possible is essential for sound reasoning, there may always be unknown factors or information beyond our reach. Similarly, Achieving perfect understanding of a subject matter is challenging due to the inherent complexity of many issues and the limitations of human cognition. While we can strive to deepen our understanding through study, research, and critical thinking, complete mastery of a subject is often elusive. Complete impartiality or objectivity in applying facts is an ideal that can be difficult to attain due to human cognitive biases, personal experiences, cultural influences, and other factors that shape our perceptions and judgments. While we can strive to minimize bias through self-awareness and critical reflection, eliminating it entirely may be unrealistic. This is one reason why processes like peer review exist. While striving for thorough knowledge, understanding, and impartiality is great for improving the reliability of logical reasoning, we need to recognize the inherent limitations and complexities involved in achieving complete reliability. Instead, the goal should be to continuously improve our reasoning skills, remain open to new information and perspectives, and critically evaluate our own assumptions and biases to strive for greater reliability in our logical reasoning. In spiritual matters, we certainly don't know all the facts, nor even a small percentage of them. Well, I'm not sure what is meant by spiritual matters. I don't know about this assertion. This would be a difficult thing to quantify. The extent to which we know or can ascertain facts in spiritual matters is subjective and varies depending on individual beliefs, perspectives, and interpretations. Unlike empirical or scientific matters where facts can be objectively verified through observation, experimentation, and evidence, spiritual matters often involve beliefs, experiences, and interpretations that are inherently subjective and don't lend themselves to quantification in some way. But I may be hung up on the wrong thing. Let's just continue. How pathetic are those foolish men who tell us there's no God? The only one who could possibly say such a thing is someone who knows all things that are possible to know and has perfect intelligence and wisdom to apply all this ocean of knowledge. Therefore, you can't say that other religions' gods don't exist. You can't say anything doesn't exist by the exact same logic. How do you know someone on earth doesn't already have this perfect intelligence and wisdom, but hides it away because they know the consequences of revealing it? You don't. This whole argument is pretty bad because it essentially requires perfect knowledge in order to know anything. This sets an impossibly high standard for knowledge, as it implies that unless one possesses omniscience, 
they can't reasonably hold any beliefs or make any assertions about the existence or non-existence of a god. This standard is unrealistic and undermines the capacity for rational inquiry and critical thinking. In reality, our understanding of the world is limited, and our beliefs are based on evidence, reasoning, and experiences available to us. It is entirely reasonable for individuals to hold beliefs based on the information that they have, even if they don't possess perfect knowledge. Furthermore, requiring absolute certainty before even entertaining the possibility of disbelief in a deity is a double standard that is not applied to any other areas of inquiry. We don't demand omniscience to reject claims of mythical creatures, conspiracy theories, or other supernatural phenomena. Instead, we evaluate the evidence, consider the arguments, and make reasoned judgments based on the available information. Therefore, while it is important to approach questions of existence and meaning with humility and open-mindedness, it is also important to recognize the limitations of human knowledge and the validity of holding beliefs based on the evidence and reasoning available to us. And if you fit that bill, you would be God yourself. Nor are we without bias. Jesus tells us that light has come into the world, but men prefer darkness over light because their deeds are evil. Ungodly men find it much too inconvenient to accept the idea of a personal God who will hold us accountable at the day of judgment. Far better to go through life pretending there are a thousand and one different reasons why Christianity and the Bible itself could not possibly be true. This is the thing that I abhor the most. He is pretending to know what is in the head of other people. I have not heard a single person say that the reason they don't believe is because it's too inconvenient to accept the idea of a God that will hold us accountable. Not once have I heard that from any non-believer. It is insulting to suggest that non-belief in a personal God or the rejection of Christianity is driven solely by convenience or a desire to avoid accountability. As I said, I don't know a single atheist that rejects religious beliefs out of convenience. Pretty much every single one does so based on some combination of critical examination of the evidence, reasoning, and lack of compelling arguments for the existence of a deity or the truth claims of Christianity. Atheism is often a result of intellectual inquiry, skepticism, and a commitment to evidence-based thinking, rather than a desire to avoid moral responsibility or accountability. Furthermore, the assertion that they are pretending there are a thousand and one different reasons why Christianity and the Bible could not possibly be true oversimplifies the diversity of perspectives and arguments within the atheist community. While atheists may critique specific aspects of Christian doctrine or biblical narratives, the reasons for disbelief are multifaceted and nuanced ranging from philosophical objections to theological inconsistencies to empirical challenges to supernatural claims. Here is some free advice. Rather than dismissing atheism or non-belief as convenient or intellectually lazy, it is more constructive to engage with the substantive critiques and arguments put forth by atheists, addressing them with intellectual honesty and openness to dialogue. Atheists, like some believers, are motivated by a quest for truth, meaning, and understanding and their perspective deserves to be engaged with respectfully and thoughtfully. Sometimes logic is utterly insufficient, and the only alternative is discovery that comes through faith. The notion that faith is the sole recourse in such moments is, frankly, bewildering. It suggests that when faced with the inadequacies of logic, we should abandon critical inquiry altogether and rely on belief unsupported by evidence. This is not only absurd, but also deeply troubling. It undermines the value of reasoned inquiry and encourages blind acceptance of ideas without scrutiny or skepticism. It is perfectly acceptable to admit, I don't know, when faced with uncertainty. In fact, acknowledging our lack of knowledge is often the first step towards genuine understanding. When we encounter gaps in our understanding, methods like the scientific method or trial and error offer systemic approaches for uncovering the truth. Through observation, experimentation, and critical analysis, we can gradually come to understand mysteries of the world around us. However, the concept of discovering things through faith raises important questions. How does one arrive at knowledge or understanding through faith? Unlike empirical methods grounded in evidence and reason, faith often entails belief without evidence or in spite of contradictory evidence. It's unclear how such a process leads to genuine discovery or understanding of anything beyond what one already believes. Is faith a wait-and-see method? If so, how does one differentiate between genuine discovery and mere confirmation bias? These are questions that I genuinely grapple with as an antitheist who is subjected to the notion of faith as some kind of virtue. How do faith-based approaches to discovery operate and lead to genuine understanding? The Bible says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.
So get experience as evidence, which is not faith. I will grant that this is arguing for personal experiences, which can function as evidence and confirmation of one's faith, but does not constitute empirical evidence the same way as we can put forth for the existence of anything else that exists in reality. I can grant that people have personal experiences with what they believe is some god, but that doesn't make them correct. That doesn't mean that what they think they are experiencing actually exists in reality. Open your Bible and read of God's goodness to us in Jesus Christ. I can agree with this, but don't just read the good parts. Read all of it. Read about dashing infants on rocks. Read about how Mr. Jesus will intentionally come to turn families against each other. Read the many verses about how women should subject themselves to men. Read all of the Bible. That is the fastest way to become an atheist. Come to Christ by faith. Open the door of your heart and you will find all kinds of spiritual riches and blessings and eternal life that are freely given you in Christ Jesus. Moore claims that he cannot back up. Many people have desperately tried to have some kind of connection with the Christian God, but with no answer, became atheists. And that's the end of his video. A lot of claims here, but what did he actually say? People in the Bible use bad reasoning and logic. But those were people trying to disprove that Mr. Jesus was a fraud. People who thought Mr. Jesus' unbelievable claims were unbelievable didn't have all the facts. It is impossible to come to right conclusions when all of the facts, especially the most important ones, are unknown. Many people stopped following Mr. Jesus after he made these claims. God does not feel obligated to make sure he makes sense. For logic to be completely reliable, you must be a perfect thinker. There is seemingly a contradiction in the Bible which some people harmonize to match a prophecy. You can't say something doesn't exist unless you have perfect knowledge. People who don't believe the Christian God are only doing so because they don't want to be judged after they die. Sometimes logic doesn't give you the answer, so you need to use faith. The title suggests this is going to explain the irrationality of atheism. So what is the actual argument? It seems like it starts with the idea that atheism is asserting the position that the Christian God does not exist. Then it posits that atheism is irrational because it rejects the possibility of spiritual truths that transcend human logic and reasoning. He suggests that faith offers a pathway to understanding and experiencing the divine, which atheism fails to acknowledge due to bias and a preference for worldly convenience. Of course, he does not give evidence as to why we should think that this is the case. He doesn't give any actual evidence, even anecdotal, which is pretty bad as even the worst apologist will offer some anecdotes of someone's experience of what they believed was God. Even so, without external validation or corroborating evidence, personal experiences alone are not anywhere near sufficient to establish the validity of spiritual claims. Dennis's only actual story, which he thought was two stories, was a mundane encounter with a rabbi who made wild claims that most didn't believe and how many of his disciples left him because of it. That's it for this one, so what did you think? Do you think that Dennis gave a good explanation as to why atheism is so irrational? Or are you like me and think that he missed the rationality part of what he was supposed to talk about? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I often see excellent discussions even between atheists in my comments, and I am very pleased to see that they are almost always very respectful. Even when two atheists disagree, the conversations seem intelligent and courteous. Thank you for setting my comment section apart from the rest of the internet. Speaking of, if you enjoyed this personal experience, hit that like button to give empirical evidence to the world. Though you can get close to being a perfect thinker by hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already and get notified for every new video I put out. Speaking of perfect thinkers, I need to give a special shout out to my patrons, Calamitous Anima, Sora, Longhaired Lefty, Musical Ocelot, Ooga Booga Luga, Tarek Alkasab, Jemimbaum, Kai Henningsen, and Triple Tau, who are the thorough knowledge, understanding, and impartiality that grounds my channel. If you would like to be one of the many that walk by sight and not by faith, you can join them for as low as a single dollar a month at patreon.com front slash dark of all trades. All of your encouragement is monumentally meaningful. Thank you all so much. And as always, keep learning.